My name is Sandra Sanchez. Um, I am a PhD candidate at Yale University. Um, I also come from Guatemala. I'm Quiche descent, so I'm very excited to hear about the Rigoberta Menchu Library. We'll definitely have to check that out. I didn't know, um, and I would love to hear the story um, about how that how that came to be. Um, I also want to echo my thanks to everyone involved in organizing this conference, setting up tech, um, having coffee, water, all of that. Um, I know that putting together conferences is a lot and it involves a lot of people, so I really appreciate it. And especially to Christina for inviting me um, to, to share um, in community with all of you wonderful scholars who I also am sort of freaking out about <laughs> being, um, being in community with. So I wanted to today um, set up my timer so I I wanted to today talk a little bit about um, some work I've been I've been doing from about the middle of my dissertation. So my dissertation um, is really um, looking at how immigration laws have impacted tribal nations that live along the U.S. Mexico and U.S. Canada border, and it's particularly comparative um, because the the kind of lands, the legal landscape that we see along the U.S.-Canada border is drastically different than we see along the U.S.-Mexico border. And um, I actually spent, I feel like, a lot of the time trying to expand beyond um, kind of histories of the Haudenosaunee activism around citizenship, which I think if you know anything about the Indian Citizenship Act, you usually know about. Um, but I thought today I would talk actually specifically about um, the uh, court case, um, McCandless v. Diabo, um, which led to the recognition of J2D rights in 1928, in which this major moment um, of success, I would argue, um, not just in histories of um, Native politics, but also in immigration history. And so I'm particularly interested in how um, we can think about um, just migration policies, particularly for indigenous migrants. Um, again, I come from Guatemala. This is something that is in the news all the time now. How do we think about the rights of migrants, but within you know the kind of settler governance and the structures that we have? Um, so in my dissertation, I argue that um, after the passage of the Indian Citizenship Act, um, we see um, this moment of success in 1928, but it establishes um, more confusion um, and more scrutiny around um, indigenous political identity that transitions into um, racial identities and blood quantum. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about that today. Okay, so let's see where I should read this. It was an unusually cool summer in 1902 when Paul Canento Daibo first crossed the border into the United States. Born in Quebec on the Mohawk Reserve in Ganawage, Daibo would make frequent trips across the Canada-U.S. border for many years after, spending time in New York, Montreal, Ohio, Michigan, and Pennsylvania pursuing work in the steel construction industry. Like many Mohawk border crossers in the early 20th century, long-standing networks of Haudenosaunee labor and kinship drew Daibo into a mobile transnational livelihood. At the turn of the century, the number of Mohawk iron workers migrating across the U.S.-Canada border began increasing as timber and steel industries expanded in the late 19th century, alongside the intrusion of the Canadian Pacific Railways. And the St. Lawrence Riverway that traced along the sister nations of Aquasasne in New York and Ganawage in Quebec also facilitated opportunities for workers to take advantage of the growing skyscraper boom as well. Just five years after Daibo's first admission into the U.S., the collapse of the Quebec Bridge Project killed 33 iron workers from Ganawage. And it was said that many women afterwards had urged their relatives to spread out on different steelwork projects across the border to avoid the wide-scale family devastation that occurred in the wake of the disaster. Many workers thus left to work across the emerging urban steel projects in New York City, Chicago, and other border cities. The steady communities of Mohawk workers arriving and living in New York even led to the development of Little Ganawage in Brooklyn, which was a neighborhood of mixed Irish, Eastern European, and Mohawk residents which flourished across the mid-20th century. Nearly everyone in Ganawage was affected by the loss of family members and friends, and Paul Daibo was likely no exception. After marrying Luis Gowanus Nolan from Ganawage in 1912, the couple traveled together across the nations, reserves, and cities dotting the U.S.-Canada border region. 
1915, they resided with Paul's brother and sister in New York, where the two brothers were employed as iron workers. And in 1919, Paul and Louise attempted to cross from Dundee, Quebec, into Fort Covington, New York, to see his newly married sister living in Philadelphia. Daibo also intended to find work in the shipyards, but was barred from entry and sent back to Montreal. Border officials marked him as illiterate and registered the couple as ineligible to enter the United States. But Daibo was able to read and write in Mohawk, just as the rest of his family could. He had also previously entered New York successfully five years earlier, despite being labeled illiterate at that time, too. Yet in the few years between Daibo's border crossings, new immigration laws and wartime anxieties had raised the level of scrutiny that migrants faced at border ports. And under the terms of the 1917 U.S. Immigration Act, all, quote, aliens, over 16 years of age who were unable to read English or any other written language, were to be labeled inadmissible for entry into the United States. While the 1917 Act's literary provision did allow for an individual to request a particular language for examination, there is no record, though, that Daibo was permitted a written test in Mohawk. Daibo continued crossing into the U.S. despite this encounter in 1919, but does not appear in immigration records again until seven years later when he and Luis were living in Philadelphia. Their appearance was also news of their arrest by Philadelphia immigration officials. The Daibos were charged with failing to possess passports, which was a wartime law that had extended into the recently passed 1924 Immigration Act for non-U.S. citizens. The couple was also deemed likely to become public charges, despite the fact that Paul Daibo reported a steady salary of $70 a week working on the construction of the Philadelphia Camden Delaware River Bridge. And in 2024 USD, this is like $1,200, which is a lot. On March 8, 1926, Commissioner of Immigration John B. McCandless initiated the Daibo's deportation proceedings and had arrested the, and arrested the couple as aliens in violation of federal immigration laws. Though almost immediately they were temporarily released on a $1,000 bail, which is a very high bail, and several months later they had hired a local firm in Philadelphia that filed an injunction to halt their deportation. Their attorney, William Nitzberg, argued against the immigration charges by emphasizing that the Daibos had crossed legally into the U.S. between 1912 and 1924 under the terms of the 1794 J Treaty, which had made no mention of passport or salary requirements for Native individuals. Nitzberg cited Article 3 of the treaty that, quote, Indians dwelling on either side of the said boundary line should have the right to freely pass and repass. This provision, Daibo's team argued, preceded the immigration law's restrictions on border passage. Surprisingly, on July 7th, uh, the injunction was upheld and their deportation rulings were dismissed. It is at this point that Luis Daibo disappears from the official court and public media record. And while Paul Daibo also appears to have returned to Ganawake, the Philadelphia Immigration Commissioner appealed the decision to overturn his deportation. Subsequently, at the urging of several fellow iron workers living across New York and Canada, Paul Daibo became convinced to return to the United States to formally challenge the application of immigration laws to Native individuals. The Daibo's deportation case was one among many from Ganawage, Akwesasne, and other border communities that had increasingly impacted tribal members since the restrictive 1924 Immigration Act's passage. And indeed, many Native seasonal labor migrants living along the U.S.-Canada border, particularly in British Columbia, had already become targets of the confusion of immigration laws that conflicted with the also recently passed U.S. Indian citizenship law. Indeed, these cases prior to the Diabos had also reached the attention of immigration officials, with the recognition that all Native individuals, quote, born within the territorial limits of the United States under the terms of the Indian Citizenship Act, were suddenly claimed as American citizens, the Indian Citizenship Act shifted the legal and physical borders of settler nationhood. And after June 2nd, 1924, if one could not prove birth or citizenship in the U.S., the native border crossers could be labeled foreigners and held subject to immigration laws, including the labor laws that restricted which foreign-born migrants could enter the U.S. and why. In the wake of both of these acts, cases of indigenous deportations had emerged because of a legislative absence that both disappeared and absorbed the distinct status of indigenous people, particularly around the ability to naturalize. Since 1790, naturalization laws had only apl applied to free white persons, until about uh, 100 years later, in the post-Civil War years, when an amendment expanded this eligibility to include aliens of African nativity and persons of African descent. 
and is well known as is well known in the fields of immigration history, the 1924 Immigration Act solidified this racial legislation around naturalization by ruling that aliens ineligible to naturalize, who were ineligible for citizenship, should be barred from entry into the U.S. Applied first to Chinese and subsequent Asian migrants, this clause also applied to indigenous people simply because they were never included under legislation regulating who could naturalize. Thus, barred from entry if one could not prove place of birth or if one's homelands were defined outside the national boundary lines of settler citizenship, Native individuals faced deportation, incarceration, and increasing surveillance by border officials who did not understand how one could be indigenous and hold two different nationalities. To be indigenous and an immigrant especially became an impossibility in the eyes of Border Patrol. Contrasting native and immigrant as categories of non-belonging, officials measured the exclusion and deportability of indigenous migrants by placing them within the racial, political, and economic hierarchies of foreignness established by the Immigration Act's quota system. So I want to consider Daibo's case for the moment and go through a couple of points that were at issue. It was decided that Paul Daibo would be a good taste, uh, good test case to challenge the application of immigration laws on tribal members, particularly the rights of Six Nation members living along and across the U.S.-Canada border. Uh, one of um, his attorney's associates had appeared before the U.S. Secretary of Labor's um, Immigration Board of Review to appeal his case um, and and, the, and, and appeal the requirements of citizenship documentation for tribal members who were crossing the U.S.-Canada border. The board rejected this claim and also denied that Native people had any treaty right to pass across the national boundary lines. And yet just two years later, in 1928, the U.S. Congress would revert this decision and declare that all Canadian-born Canadian Indians were free to pass the U.S.-Canada border without any application of immigration laws. And although organizing for indigenous border crossing rights expanded beyond the Six Nations, I do want to highlight why border crossing was in particular a central issue for the Haudenosaunee. And since the 18th century, Haudenosaunee, or the Six Nations of Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Tuscarora, Cayuga, and Seneca, had fought against attempts to nationalize their territories as both the U.S. and Canada sought to extend their legal power over Native nations. And the Six Nations Reserve in Ontario, in particular, became a center of opposition to the Canadian Department of Indian Affairs and its attempts to enfranchise or make into Canadian citizens those who held native status. And actually, I should say British subjects because Canadian citizenship wasn't there until about 1947. Haudenosaunee opposition to the DIA or the Indian Affairs abolition of traditional band governance had led to decades of opposition and splintered local leadership between tribal communities supporting or resisting the intervention into Haudenosaunee governance. The importance of movement between Canada and the U.S. to these communities both shaped the immediate resistance and controversies between tribes living in Canada and the U.S., who sometimes were in opposition to one another. So there were two major questions considered in Daibo's case. One, whether the Jay Treaty of 1794 had legal standing, and two, if immigration and deportation laws applied to Indigenous people. So in, in his own argument, Daibo emphasized that since his first admission to the United States, he had, quote, always considered this country his permanent home, this being the U.S., and that he had entered lawfully on November 1st, 1924. To be deported, he continued, would be an unlawful understanding of the treaties between the United States and, quote, the Indians in North America, especially the Indians of the Iroquois tribes. Daibo also emphasized that his tribal identity, both racially and politically, was as a full-blooded Indian. In response, the inspector of Philadelphia, who was representing the immigration office, um, denied nearly all of his argument, um, even including his claim of his own savings and his legal marriage. Um, but the inspector emphasized instead that they had no uh, record of his legal entry, and they refuted his claim that he had ever resided continuously in the United States. Daibo, he argued, had done nothing to work towards permanent home ownership and had no protection to enter the United States at will, including any treaty rights. And it's this last point that's really crucial, because the Immigration Office denied any outside influence as well on the authority to deport Daibo and other individuals. Even if they had admitted that treaty rights existed, which of course they didn't, um, and if the federal court intended to intervene, which it did, the inspector argued that this would be illegal. Deportation was the complete and absolute power of the Secretary of Labor to decide, and the inspector argued that this was not subject to review or interference by the courts of the United States. Such plenary power, the immigration inspector suggested, overruled any claim protections and treaty rights and mandated Daibo's deportation. So looking at the decision that ultimately was upheld, um, both in its uh, 
eventual appeal. Um, the district court judge, Oliver Dickinson, um, who was the one that ordered Daibo's deportation be overturned, um, offers a couple of really interesting arguments here. So in his decision, Dickinson notes that Indians, although he calls them an alien people, quote, have always been recognized as a nation and as a race independent of U.S. governmental control. He underscored that divisions of native lands accounted for by government maps and treaties, including the national borders, were secondary to longstanding indigenous territories. Here I quote, the boundary line to establish the respective territory of the United States and of Great Britain, which the Jay Treaty is about, was clearly not intended to, and just as clearly did not affect the Indians. It made no division of their country. So considering the Jay Treaty, the judge argued that the boundary lines were established to regulate the treaty parties of the U.S. and Great Britain, and only their recognition, not a gift, nor creation of tribal mobility as a sovereign right. The Jay Treaty of 1794 was an express was an expression of this principle, and it permitted tribes to cross the territorial boundary lines at will. And although the opposition argued that the end of the War of 1812, which was between the U.S. and Great Britain, had ended any treaty agreements between the two countries, the judge affirmed that, again, this right of the Indians to cross the border existed before and after the formal existence of the Jay Treaty. Dickinson thus turns to the second question, on whether indigenous people were included among the alien nations regulated by U.S. immigration law. The United States, he argued, has always recognized, quote, native, well, not this part. The United States has argued has always recognized native nations as, quote, an imperium in imperio. And I think it's notable here that Dickinson did not use the more common phrase within U.S. Indian policy that I'm sure we're all aware of, of domestic dependent nations, but one instead drawing from an Anglo-American legal tradition of considering supreme power within supreme power or sovereignty within sovereignty. This is actually, a t and I, I, I do point out that Imperium and Imperio is something I'm still kind of like trying to think through. I welcome any comments about, um, but it is, it is actually used um, in the 1830s around the, the case of the Cherokees um, when um, kind of used to describe both on one hand uh, to portray the, the Cherokees as kind of this abnormal Imperium, therefore as a threat to U.S. sovereignty, but then also in opposition um, to describe the state's relationships to the federal governments and to kind of like um, contextualize this, the conflict between state and federal powers there. So the judge ruled that native sovereign rights to border crossing should be upheld, and the Jay Treaty provisions did not end upon the conclusion of the war between the U.S. and Great Britain, just as the borderline itself did not disappear. And while the INS immediately appealed, the appellate court upheld this decision as well, and Daibo was released from deportation, custody. What is interesting as well, that months after the decision, after this decision, a very similar question would reach the Supreme Court in the case of the United States v. Carnith. At issue in this case was a similar question of whether the Jay Treaty was applicable to protect border crossing rights, although this time for white British subjects who were living in Canada and who were employed as day laborers crossing into the U.S. Similar to Daibo's case, these subjects were arrested for failing to possess immigration documents, and they cited the very same Article 3 of the Jay Treaty that in its complete phrasing had stated that his majesty's subjects and the citizens of the United States and also the Indians dwelling on either side of the said boundary line may freely pass and repass. Um, and in this case, um, it was ruled that the Jay Treaty was not, um, um, not at, had no legal standing and was in fact um, not at all applicable. So Carnith also questioned whether the INS had authority to issue um, a ruling which had said that um, any temporary visitors uh, who were considered immigrants, um, or excuse me, if temporary visitors, which was a, there were exemptions around temporary visitors entering into the United States. And there had been a ruling um, that admitted a lot of the native seasonal migrant workers under this temporary exemption. Um, and in between uh, the years of Daibo's case being argued, this exemption was overturned. Um, and this was also a central issue in Carnith because it applied to the day laborers as well. Um, and again, the court upheld the plenary power to establish um, immigration control or control over immigration law and deportation law fully within the arms um, of Congress. So Paul Daibo was not the first indigenous person to be stopped at the border, nor to be, nor to be deported for failing to possess legal documentation for a citizenship status. But his, his case was the first national legal contention of the status of native citizenship after 1924 and was a catalyst for the passage of the 1928 amendment to the Immigration Act that emerges after this, and particularly because of that question around temporary visitors um, and the eligibility of the Jay Treaty, the amendment comes out to fully express um, um, 
Congress admitting that Canadian-born Indians were eligible under J Treaty provisions to cross into U.S. And in 1928, um, when they were considering uh, who would be eligible under this law, essentially who counted as Canadian-born Indian, um, the Immigration and Naturalization Services ruled that, quote, whether an a- or not an alien is properly within the terms of the act should be determined not by the degree of any particular blood, but by determining if the alien is actually recognized as a Canadian-born American Indian. However, following Daibo's case, um, the Solicitor General of the U.S. had remarked um, on the consequences that he believed for free border passage for Native individuals that he also argued would lead to a problem of inspecting or needing to inspect, um, quote, the Indians crossing the boundary line. The consequences of recognizing the Jay Treaty um, through the amendment, he argued, quote, Uh, was that not only British subjects of the black and white races, but also those of the Oriental races, could enter Canada and immediately gain admission to the United States as border crossers for an indefinite period without regard to the immigration laws. And so one of the things I argue then after um, this amendment is that um, we see this language um, increasingly turn to blood quantum um, as a consequence of trying to scrutinize exactly who is eligible um, under this. And if you know anything about enfranchisement, this became a huge issue um, because the immigration officials argued, well, if you've been enfranchised, um, you actually no longer count under the treaty terms. You are no longer considered Canadian-born Indian. Um, um, I'm kind of running out of time here, so I'll just kind of, to conclude here is that um, by 1952, with the next major immigration law um, that was passed, um, the McCarran-Walter Act, um, you actually see the terms of the amendment enshrined within the immigration bill. So in 1924, there was no mention of indigenous people. um, And then in 1952, there was, but this amendment um, was instead restricted to those of one half blood quantum. Today, it's one quarter blood quantum. Um, So we can kind of think about the way that um, the concept of indigenous people as immigrants or ineligible as applicable to immigration laws as applicable to deportation some of these questions on residents i think that your your presentation brought up for me um kind of transitions and we see right up into the period of termination this explicit um acknowledgement of a kind of racial um indian status um that provides much more complex complex um issues around uh border crossing that i'd be happy to get into um if anyone wants to ask but i think i'll end here so thank you